tell you a story. The first story my father told me and the first story that I told each of you. In the beginning, there was nothing. Nothing but the silence of an infinite darkness. But the breath of the Creator fluttered against the face of the void, whispering, let there be light. And light was. And it was good. The first day. And then the formless light began to take on substance and shape. The second day. And our world was born. Our beautiful, fragile home. And a great warming light nurtured its days. And a lesser light ruled the nights. And there was evening. And morning. Another day. And the waters of the world gathered together. And in their midst emerged dry land. Another day passed. And the ground put forth the growing things. A thick blanket of green stretching across all creation. And the waters too teemed with life. Great creatures of the deep that are no more. Vast multitudes of fish some of which may still swim beneath these seas. And soon, the sky was streaming with birds. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. Now the whole world was full of living beings. Everything that creeps, everything that crawls, and every beast that walks upon the ground. And it was good. It was all good. There was light, and air, and water, and soil, all clean and unspoiled. Of plants and fish and fowl and beast, each after their own kind, all part of the greater whole, all in their place, and all was in balance, it was paradise, the jewel in the Creator's path. And the Creator made man, and by his side woman, father and mother of us all. He gave them a choice. Follow the temptation of darkness or hold on to the blessing of light. Boker Tov, everyone, and welcome to our newest uh, Soulful Psalms. I've just shown you a clip from the movie Noah, which has gotten mixed reviews, but I think is really one of the best biblical films ever made. And certainly the opening sequence in which uh, the uh, main character repeats the idea of genesis of the creation is a fabulous sequence and a good introduction to this because we're going to be doing psalm 104 and psalm 104 is for lack of a better term a narrative of creation now it comes with some complexities as it turns out there is not one version of the creation narrative in the in the Bible. There are several. And uh, we experience the Genesis story at the very beginning of the book, uh, the collection, to be the definitive account of what Jews believed, what Israelites believed, what Jews believe uh, is the uh, sacred process of creation. That is not quite accurate. As I think I've alluded to before, the Bible was probably uh, much oral literature before it was written literature. Uh, there was a lot of mythic narrative storytelling going on during the oral period. And we probably have several different versions of the creation myth in our tradition and, and are embedded in the Bible. Now, clearly, Genesis 1 through 2 is the dominant one. Uh, that is the product of what my teachers would call canonical criticism. That is, that you uh, communicate your priorities based on the position of the text within the overall collection. So. If you start out with the Genesis narrative, which was probably created by the priests in the temple, then that's the narrative we all hold in our head as being 
the Jewish narrative. But in fact, that's not the case. We have several other narratives uh, with differing sequences and even differing creation processes that appear in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, I always call attention to uh, Job 38, uh, which gives a different account of God and his relationship to creating the world. Uh, we also have uh, Psalm, I believe it's 74, which even goes so far as to indicate that God created the world by theomachy, that is by warfare against the forces of chaos, rather than the narrative we have in Genesis of God simply speaking the world into existence through speech acts. And here in Psalm 104, we also have a different structure. Now, it is not necessarily contradictory to Genesis 1-2, uh, but it also doesn't uh, follow the sequence or uh, give a sense of order to the way order was created. Rather, for poetic purposes, the emphasis is on certain kinds of drama and acts and a kind of funneling down to the center part of the psalm where we get to us and then spreading out again, taking us from a cosmic top to a cosmic bottom, a kind of hourglass uh, poetry arrangement. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, if you are familiar, with uh, our Friday night services, you know that on some occasions we do service number two rather than service number one in our uh, purple prayer book. And rather than put in the famous uh, Yotzer Or or Ma'ariv Aravim that were composed by the rabbis, we use a abbreviated version of 104 to express our gratitude to God for creation, because that first blessing uh, is a blessing for God's creative power. And so we use Psalm 104 in part as that language uh, to express this. It's a beautiful psalm, and uh, I'm going to walk you through it. So it begins uh, with the great order of creation of cosmos. And it, it sees um, humanity in that context. So it begins with a very, very personal declaration. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, you are very great. That is the opening passage, and it will be repeated as an envelope structure at the very end of the psalm. So. Um, it talks about God in a macro anthropomorphic form. God, you are clothed in glory and majesty, wrapped in a robe of light or wrapped in light like a robe. Uh, uh, it's a, a simile that uh, is to capture the idea of the night sky which is full of stars, and to imagine God enrobes uh, in, in himself in that majestic, uh, almost infinite uh, reality above our heads. Uh, it is only the briefest data given to us about uh, God himself. Uh, the point of this psalm is really that God is evident in God's deeds and deeds in the form of creative execution. Now, it uh, does embrace a quasi-pagan element to it, as I've called attention to in other Psalms. Uh, he, um, he makes the clouds his chariot, uh, moves on the wings of the wind. That is an image comes straight out of Ugaritic poetry about Mbal. So uh, I, I think that that's at least a vestual example of how uh, these ideas are adapted to a monotheistic tradition. And um, it goes on to describe how he established the earth on its foundations and he uh, 
covered the earth as with water as he would a garment. So again, this is mirrors the idea of the stars and the night sky being God's robe. Now the earth is enrobed in water. Now this clearly contradicts the um, order given to us in Psalm one in Genesis one two. It's just a minor thing, and again, one could ascribe it to poetic ordering rather than any attempt to persuade us one way or another about how things go, but just realize that this is not uh, your father's Genesis account. All right. Uh, the waters stood above the mountains. Apparently, our ancestors understood that islands were simply sub, uh, were submerged mountains that peaked out above. Uh, they fled at your blast, rushed away at the sound of your thunder. That is God taming the waters in the sense that uh, the waters know that there are boundaries that they must exist within, and the land is there because of that. And on and on it goes. You uh, make springs gush forth in torrents. Uh, they make their way between the mountains or between the hills. Uh, give drink to all the wild beasts. And then you start hearing about birds. Now, this bird idea will reiterate itself several times in this poem. The birds of the sky dwell beside them and sing among the foliage. You water the mountains from your high places. Uh, the earth is sated from the fruit of your work. So now the cosmos is narrowing down to animate and sentient life on earth and uh and then it goes on to say herbage for man's labor he gets food out of the earth wine cheers the hearts of men oil makes the face shine the bread that sustains man's life and that's it for us we get four sticks out of the whole thing and then suddenly we are returning to the trees and the cedars and the plants, and then back to the birds. Uh, the birds get their second repetition here. The birds make their nest. The stork has her home in the junipers. The high mountains are for wild goats. The crags a refuge for rock badgers. Don't really know what a rock badger is. It's gotta be something operating in mid height and climate, but we don't know for sure. Uh, could be a badger, could be marmot, could be a bunch of different things. Anyway, and then it goes back up to the sky, the uh, garment that originally embraced God. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The, nun, no, uh, the sun knows it's time to set. You bring on darkness and it is night uh, when the beasts of the forest stir and the animals roar for prey. Um, it's pious lions. The lions, when they're roaring, are actually calling upon God to bring them uh, a delicious morsel that they may feast upon, uh, seeking food from their God. So man is, in this psalm, in harmony with all the other creatures, all the other, uh, I think C.S. Lewis called us the pensioners of God's graciousness, whether it be plants or animals, birds or fish, each one of us has our niche in which we uh, live and which we can thrive. So um, we then get a little more reference to man uh, who goes out in his work and his labor until the evening and on the poem goes. And uh, so again, we have this narrowing down to our condition, the condition of our the fellow animals, and then it spreads out again, um, emphasizing the idea of being nourished by God's creation. It sustains all of life on the earth. Uh, may the glory of God endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Uh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, hallelujah. There is the uh, concluding envelope structure in uh, 35. Uh, there is a brief mention of sinners. We don't use that on Friday night. 
Uh, but uh, the poem is a wonderful elegy to the created world and serves us to remind ourselves that we do not exist at the apex of existence, but in the middle, uh, that we are embedded within a larger structure of life-sustaining creation. It's a beautiful psalm. It's a lovely psalm. And I hope that uh, you get a wonderful inspiration out of it, just a reminder that we should always be grateful for our particular niche in God's world.